Welcome, everyone. This is, uh, we have two complimentary webinars for you every Thursday, the first and third Thursday of the month. And this particular presentation is talking about what are those boys thinking? Uh, my name's Jim Littlejohn. Let me uh, kind of give you some street cred, if you will. This is my bio. I'll kind of let you look at that to uh, get a sense of who I am. Primarily, I've been an educator, but I worked in industry for four years prior to becoming a, an educator and been in the education business ever since. I've worked with uh, the AHA process for almost 20 years now. I guess when you look at this resume, the first thing that jumps out is me is I just can't keep a job. It's so frustrating, but uh, I've had lots of life opportunities. Well, let's jump into our, our presentation. Here's kind of the focus of our webinar today. We're going to look at the influence of positive male role models. How important is that? Uh, we're going to talk about similarities and differences in brain development for both males and females. And we're going to kind of address some strategies to mitigate that brain developmental differences. And last but not least, kind of look at the uh, impact of emotions on males and what's the significant difference between how males and females deal with their emotions. Two big ideas that we're gonna talk about today, uh, and these are have major implications for, for our boys. One is the cognitive development of males. Males and females will develop cognitively uh, and reach the same endpoint, but we go about it differently. Emotionally, males and females, again, as we mentioned, have the same emotions, but how we manifest them is completely different. I want you to think about this. I want you to kind of put inside your head a boy who is struggling this particular school year. Or if you don't work in a school business, a, a boy that you're working with. This could be a student. This could be the son of a client that you might have. This could be your own son or grandson or other relative. Just kind of keep this young person inside your head throughout the day. And as we talk about these things, do you see how some of the topics that we talk about, how some of the strategies we talk about, and some of the ideas we talk about uh, identify what these boys are all about. I'm gonna show you a video clip. Uh, I love to use video clips in my live presentations. Uh, this comes from a documentary called The Mask You Live In. It's very powerful. And what I want you to think about as you watch this clip is what is the impact of school on boys? Do these statistics hold true in your work with boys? So I'm gonna set the screen up for you. We're gonna to try to show this video clip. It takes a little bit to get it going. And then we'll have a discussion after it's. What is there about being a boy in America that places boys at greater risk? we're seeing clearly that boys who come from low-income families, and I, when I say boys, I mean white boys as well, are less likely to go to college, more likely to drop out of school. In most schools, we start with humiliation to, as a way to punish kids write the name on the board, put them in the back of the room, send them out. We rarely stop and ask, what's behind the behavior problem? Why is this child acting out? Denying those kids learning time actually has the effect of pushing many of them right out of school. They will kick a kid out of school knowing that a kid who isn't reading by the fourth grade is going to be in the prison system. Well, you kicked him out twice in the third grade because he did this to his teacher. Ain't nobody in that child's life ever hugged him. Go into a kindergarten class. You're talking about boys, watch, they're, they're doing this. Ask them a question. They can't shut up. They're jumping up and down, waving their hands. All right. Go to the same class when they're six, in the sixth grade. And ask them a question. What do you think? I don't know. Whatever. It's cool. I <laughs> mean, in those five years, the academic pilot light has started to go out because they have decided that school is not the place for them. The number one predictor of student achievement it's the expectations of the staff. 
The school system just did not, they didn't believe in the kids. In fact, because they were black and brown kids, they didn't think they could do well. Everybody has potential if they're provided with the right support and the right stimulation. All right, all right. I want you to, want think, you to about, think about uh, uh, what you, what you just saw. saw. And uh, here are the questions that were raised or the statistics that were raised and how many of these particular statistics, again, hold true for you. Here's number one. Compared to girls, boys are more likely to flunk or drop out of school. Does that tend to hold true with the students that you work with or the young people that you know? Number two, compared to girls, boys are two times more likely to be in special education. How about number three? Boys are three times more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD or ADD or EIEIO, whatever other letters you want to apply. Uh, we tend to find more boys are involved in these kinds of uh, issues that, that may tend to keep them from succeeding as well as they can. Number four, boys are two times more likely to be suspended. And number five, four times more likely to be expelled. Uh, that pattern from, from my experience tends to hold true everywhere that I've been to. And I've been very blessed to be in all 50 states and in Canada of having these conversations. So let's continue our, our, our dialogue and talk about this. We're gonna look at about four fundamentals today. Um, the first one is positive male role models help boys develop an authentic male identity. And a positive male role model, we would hope would be a father or the dad, but doesn't necessarily have to be. It can be any male who really identifies with the student or the, the young man and helps them become a better person, if you will. What's so interesting is males tend to, and I use that term intentionally, tend to learn better through visual observation. They are visual learners, so they need to see what this role model looks like. Here's a question for you, and I'll just let you kind of think about this. What is a real man? I have to drop my voice. What is a real man? And uh, what does that mean? What are the attributes of a real man? Kind of think about that for a second. And however you address that, hopefully it's not just the physical differences, but uh, what is a real man emotionally? What is a real man uh, socially? How do they interact with others? Well, if whatever you said is a definition of a real man, the bottom line tends to be for our young boys is where do they learn to be a man in today's world? If they're learning from their same aged peers, that's problematic. If they're learning it from video or TV or movies or music, that's problematic. If they're learning it from a man who possesses some of these uh, ideal characteristics, that's a good thing. Uh, there's a couple of references that I'd like to make with you that are, are the research behind this. So here's the first one, and this comes from a university study, three different universities uh, participate in this study. Basically what it boils down to this, uh, fathers and sons. Now I put in parentheses positive role model because I don't want to change what they apply, but I'm going to suggest that you can have a positive role model and that will do the same thing and it doesn't necessarily have to be the dad, but according to their research, fathers who are actively involved with their sons from infancy are less aggressive, less overly competitive, and better able to express feelings of vulnerability and sadness boys, in essence, were generally more empathetic. Uh, this research is also backed up by William Pollock, who was one of the first authors who really jumped into the, the whole issue of is there a boy crisis. The more time fathers stayed close to the boys, the better the boys did in high school, college, and the workplace. And again, I would suggest to you that it just doesn't have to be the father. It can be any positive male role model. The key thing here is not necessarily the quant the uh, quantity of time, but it's more about the quality of time that these young boys have had spent with positive adult male role models. The next of the fundamentals we want to look at is how male and female brains have similarities and differences. And, you know, I always carry with me when I do presentations a spare brain. Now, my uh, friends sometimes say, Jim, that's a good thing to have us 
bare brain, but uh, uh, what's so interesting about the brain is that we're going to look at, we're going to look at tendencies, not absolutes, okay? Uh, if you would, let me give you an example of this. Kind of put your hands together like this. That is, in essence, the size of your brain. Uh, kind of disappointing when I look at that. Um, male brains tend to be larger than female brains. Size doesn't matter. And the reason I say that is because if you look at how autopsies were conducted and who were the ones doing the early research on size and weight of brains, it was males. So males will sometimes kind of um, say, yep, we, we're, we're all about that. But again, keep in mind, size <clears throat> doesn't matter. And why are male brains, why do they tend to be larger? Males physically tend to be larger. So here's the next concept we want you to think about. How are boys and girls alike and how are they different? Now you can kind of bypass the whole issue of physicality. Uh, that's pretty obvious. Um, but how are they alike? What are they, how do they do things similarly? How do they do things differently? Think about that for a second. Okay, when I first got the opportunity to, to work a little more with the, the Boys in Crisis, Dr. Slocum's book. Uh, it came after he passed, unfortunately passed away. So I thought, you know, if I'm gonna do this, I better get some authentic research. So what I decided to do was, I was gonna examine my grandkids. All my children are adults, uh, but I wanted to look at my grandkids. So I'm gonna give you an example. Both of these, <clears throat> one is my grandson, Aiden, who at the time I started doing this was four, and Sulia, my granddaughter was five. So they come to the house, they start playing, and we didn't say, you hope all well, boys have to play with this and girls have to play with that, but we just let them play. And I'll give you two quick examples. One, if Aiden picked up some kind of car or truck or something, he would push it as fast as he could and run it into a piece of furniture and just crash and say, yeah, rah, 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 you know, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> when Sulia did this, what she would do is she would take the car, take the truck, look at the wheels, kind of spin the wheels one at a time, and then kind of examine it and then put it and just gently roll it, okay? When Aiden decided to play with one of the, the dolls, okay? We'll call it a Barbie doll for an example. What he wanted to do was pull the arms and the legs off and throw them. That didn't mean he was gonna grow up to be a psychopath. That just meant he liked to see movement and action. When Sulia played with the dolls, what she would do is she would gently kind of move their arms back and forth and kind of set them up in positions. So that's just one example. If you have a son and a daughter, you know how these things work, right? But let's look at some of the science behind this, okay? Um, in her book, The Trouble with Boys, Peg Tire talks about this example. And this is from the work of Dr. Frances Baines. And basically what she says is this, uh, the myelination, which is on neurons, for girls from age six shows about 25% more myelination in the hippocampal formation. Um, let me see if I can give you an example of that. Myelination is basically the coding. If this is a neuron, it's a coding that goes on the neuron. It allows information to transfer faster. So if you keep that thought in mind, basically what that implies is that girls are gonna get to the information much quicker. Brain development, here's uh, from the National Institute of Mental Health. They did MRI scans for a 12-year study, and here's what they found. Regions of the brain tend to develop with a different sequence, tempo, and pace, okay? Boys and girls will eventually get to the same place cognitively. They're just gonna go about it and a different sequence, tempo, and pace. Here, here's my mental model, my analogy of what that looks like. For females, keeping in mind that they got the myelination, almost 24% more myelination, so that's gonna benefit them in this perspective as well. I like to think of the girl brain as being a sprinter brain. Starts fast, gets the information, gets it, applies it, and uses it. I like to think of the male brain a little differently. The male brain is more like a marathon runner. And what that means is they will take longer to reach their destination. Now, I want you to keep in mind that both males and females will again get to the same point, but they're gonna go about it from different sequence, tempo, and pace. So what does that mean in a classroom environment when you have boys and girls sitting side by side? You're really looking at potentially two different 
ways to gather and get and process information. In this next slide, <clears throat> males versus female brain, okay? These are tendencies, not absolutes. These are tendencies. Here's the first one. Boys tend to have their gross motor skills develop faster. Let's go back to my grandson, Aiden. Why was he throwing? Why was he tearing these arms apart? It was because he liked the movement. So gross motor skills develop faster. If you'll notice, um, the examples include running, walking, lifting, sitting, and throwing. My guess is you're probably not going to find in any classroom across the United States uh, the rules posted that say, oh, please run around in the classroom. Please throw things. Please lift things. No, nope. it's basically going to boil down to this. Come in, sit down, and get to work. <clears throat> well, the problem with coming in, sitting down, and getting to work is that if I have to do that for too long, I pretty much get tired of that. Um, Let's look at what happens with girls. The fine motor skills tend to develop faster, okay? And that's the refined movements of fingers, thumbs. In other words, it's I can learn to write more effectively, quicker. I can have that fine motor skills. Now, to give you evidence of how that can change very quickly, or not very quickly, but how that changes over a long period of time, when we look at neurosurgeons across the United States, the majority of neurosurgeons tend to be male. That's not necessarily a good thing, but that's just the way it is. The just goes to show that males will catch up. The problem is we're not starting at the same place at the same time. So what does that look like? Uh, for boys, the issue might be the struggle to control a pencil or a paintbrush. And so here's what may happen in a classroom in a very innocent way that the teacher might say this or do this is, oh, Jamal, look at, uh, look at Jasmine's work. Look how good she's trying look at the colors that she uses well what jamal is hearing is you want me to be like a girl especially in early elementary school and you know as we well know many times boys do not necessarily want to be like girls they have that little animosity with each other about i want to be who i am and hang with my buddies and so on so that can create a problem second thing again we just mentioned this prefer not to sit for long periods of time by the way that holds true in the classroom as well as in the boardroom uh, males do tend to want to move and move often. Third thing, males tend to have more high physical energy. So I like to think of uh, in the classrooms, what we need to do is to control that energy. You control that energy by putting in place activities that allow for movement. That lack of fine motor skills lagging behind as late as fifth grade. And why is that problematic? Because when we move from learning how to read and reading to learn, and I got to put that on paper, that becomes problematic. And then we come more of a reluctance to do pencil paper activities, uh, kind of what they talked about in the mask you live in. Two factors tend to shape boys every experience and the way others perceive them. Here's the first one. Boys tend to lack behind girls verbally and mature more slowly than girls. Again, we will both catch up at the same, eventually, uh, but not at the same time. Second, boys tend to be more physically active, moving faster and staying in motion longer. And if you don't control that, um, that can create some problems for you. Prefrontal cortex, you know, kind of if you're, you're sitting there looking at this, just kind of touch your prefrontal cortex right there at the top of your head. What does that do? What is a prefrontal cortex? What's uh, the main functions of the prefrontal cortex? We tend to call that the executive control center and look at what it eventually does. Controls higher order thinking and problem solving and interfaces with the emotional system, which is what we call the limbic system, okay? Take a minute, look at this cartoon from Dennis the Menace. Oh, I forgot, my teacher sent you this note last November, mom. Here's the concept, out of sight, out of mind. Okay, and for boys, because they're such visual learners, sometimes, you know, we, we put things in our head and forget where they are, and you're gonna see why that happens in just a minute. Here's what else the prefrontal cortex does. It controls tasks such as getting started on on time, something, sustaining attention, remembering critical information, monitoring one of actions and memory. Basically what that means is this. I call that success at school, success at work. Uh, one of the problems is just as boys and girls begin to catch up with one another, especially at uh, once they start to go through before puberty, when they reach puberty, 
everything changes. The growth of the prefrontal cortex tends to slow down because literally the brain is pruning all of the information that they gain about how to deal with your parents. And now it's like, I gotta become independent. So that's problematic in itself, okay? Talk about kind of a, a big picture, if you will. Males tend to be more literal and objective. Females tend to be more approximate and subjective. Let me see if I can give you an example of that. Uh, let's just say for argument's sake, uh, you come home and you happen to notice across the state, especially for our, our female participants, you notice that across the street, your BFF, your best friend and neighbor has just received a dozen roses. Now you're processing and you're thinking, wait a minute, it's not her birthday, it's not her holiday, it's not an anniversary because you know her so well. Your next thought might be, what did that man do wrong? Because he's trying to cover himself, okay? Well, if that was your thinking until you find out what was going on, uh, that can be problematic for the next male that walks into your home, especially if it's your significant other. So what happens is you find out what was going on, why did they get the flowers? And basically here's the concept. Uh, your friend says, oh, he got them because he loved me. So your guy now walks in the door. You say to him, why don't you ever get me flowers? What happens inside that man's head is he very quickly has to figure out, uh-oh, what did I miss? Uh, was it a birthday? Was it an anniversary? What was a holiday? And so I start asking questions. Um, well, what, what, color flowers do you want? And you basically say, it's not about color. Well, how many do you want? It's not about quantity. Well, what kind do you want? And again, we're asking all these questions because our concept, our idea is that obviously we did something that didn't get you the flowers. So I need to figure out how to make that happen. And basically what the female wanted was just, you know, an idea that says, show me that you care. Now, how does that look? in this graph. Take a minute to look at this. If we want to think about the male brain, um, and some folks call this uh, male brains have waffles as brains and females have spaghettis as brains. So here's another interpretation of that. When a male brain is beginning to process information, again, this is a metaphor, I have to go literally into a room. I have to open that door, step in that room, deal with the problem, and when I'm finished with that problem, I'm done with it. I close the door and walk out. I do not take problem number one into room number two, or room number three, or room number four, or room number five, because every problem is dealt with separately in the room. So in the room about flowers, I have to figure out color, quantity, what kind, and again, your message was, the female's message was, oh, it's just about showing me how much you care. So if males process that way, you can see how that can be problematic, all right? Or different, not necessarily problematic, but different. If you look at the female brain in this analogy, first of all, you notice there are no doors. And what that simply means is whatever happens in one room can happen in another room and can happen in another room. Okay, and so all these things are going back and forth and moving forward, and it's all linked to this concept called emotions. So females do not necessarily separate in context one issue to another issue, we combine it, okay? Again, kind of a, the big, big picture, big picture is for male brain, deal with the problem until it's resolved with the female brain, deal with the problem until it's resolved, but I'm not gonna forget the problem and move forward with it. I will carry it with me. Some other big picture ideas, male traits. Males will tend to get a rush, for lack of a better word, um, when there's something risky taking place. It's kind of a fight or flight response. Boys are more likely to overestimate their own ability while girls are more likely to underestimate their own ability. Uh, that's not necessarily good for either one, but for girls, thanks to uh, Title IX and other uh, STEM applications, uh, girls are getting a better opportunity to be, you know, to do more risky kinds of things, safe risky things, okay? Boys have less serotonin, less oxytocin, which makes them more impulsive and less likely to sit still for long periods of time.
So what are some things we can do? What are some strategies when working with boys and corporate the use of manipulatives and movement? Now, here's the problem, as we've already mentioned. If you start putting manipulatives in boys' hands, they may tend to be launched from their hands. So uh, your, your management, your classroom management, your behavior issues and so on have to be addressed ahead of time. In other words, set up the rules and procedures for what's going to happen. How boys work in pairs? Why? If they start working in groups, the tendency is they're going to have to first figure out who out of these groups is going to be the alpha male. And they'll spend all their time trying to determine who's going to be in charge versus getting the job done. Include competition. Now, the key to competition is this. Uh, you have to be, in essence, the referee. Boys love the concept of winning. Girls do too, but girls will tend, again, I'm going to use the word tend, uh, to follow the rules a little more and where the boys may try to reinvent the rules to meet their particular needs. Praise privately. Why is that so important? Uh, if you praise a boy publicly, his friends may think he's a kiss up or teacher's pet, those kinds of things. So if you praise privately, you can drive home the point and not uh, what he might think is humiliating, but you're really not doing that. Some other ideas, give boys more space, okay? Uh, possible twice the physical body space that they're in, because again, this, this movement is so critically important for them. Now, this is an interesting one. Uh, the females need to speak louder for in a louder voice for males, and males need to speak in a more quiet voice when they're dealing with females. Why? Primarily because uh, males and females hear differently. Now, I know you're laughing at this, uh, but what that means is the female brain tends to be able to adjust to a higher frequency, so they will hear more details. Listening and hearing are two different things. Hearing is biological, listening is intentional. Males uh, get a bad rap for not listening, but hearing, it's a biological issue. This one drives female teachers crazy. This wiggling, pencil tapping, thumping, all those kinds of things that is a movement activity for boys to stay focused. One of the best tools to use to kind of reduce that is, you know, get a sponge. I'll just use my little brain here. Get a sponge. And if boys are going to tap on that sponge, you don't hear it. If he does this, that's intentionality. There's a difference between uh, just having that physical movement to stay focused versus doing something that's going to be intentionally uh, designed to cause problems or to draw attention to themselves. Now, I did not make this quote up, but I want you to think about this one. Kids say the most profound things. As one six-year-old boy described, school is where you sit at a desk all day and listen to women talk. That comes from the Helping Boys Succeed uh, book. Again, uh, it may be an over-exaggeration, but for some boys, that's the case. Again, if I can get some movement, I can help reduce that. Here's an next fundamental we want to address. Both genders have the same emotions, but we process them differently. Okay? And by processing differently, that simply means how are we going to manifest those emotions? Take a minute to look at this. There's the boy on the left. All of a sudden, you notice there's something different going on. He's beginning to think about something. Go to the third picture. Now, you can tell by, look at his nonverbals, look at the body language saying something's wrong. Now the fist comes up and eventually it goes to that extreme. The problem I find is that if we don't address what's going on with the, the difference between the first, the second, third, and fourth, if we wait to that last uh, physical response, that's problematic, okay? If you look at these five boys, what is going on inside their heads? Which of these five boys, if you were, were walking in a hallway and you had a, or you saw all five of these boys, what would you be thinking about what's going on inside their head? Uh, let me give you an example of how to look at it differently. Uh, the boy in the upper left-hand corner. If that is the first time I see him smiling, happy, I wanna talk to him about that. I wanna find out what is going on in his life because maybe up until that point, he's not seen that, I've not seen that kind of response from him. If I go to the one in the lower left, okay, with the some more. I might be thinking, he's saying, you know, Mr. LJ, I think I want to stick this some more inside your head because he's upset with me. I kind of see that smirk. The boy in the middle, he's literally trying to squeeze my head off because he doesn't like necessarily what I did. The boy in the upper right, 
my concern for him might be, I recognize that he's got a problem going on. I also recognize he needs some time to process that. So I might say, if you're okay, it's fine. Take a minute, get yourself together, and we'll move on. The boy in the bottom right-hand corner is the one that I'm the most concerned about because based on my life history, that would be me. Not the fact that uh, he's shooting basketball, but he might be masking the real pain that is going on inside his head. So he'll use another methodology to focus and get rid of the pain that's going on him. Again, the idea is we don't all emote at the same way. Get down to this issue of nature versus nurture, anger and aggression versus emotional vocabulary. Uh, biology and experience do have an important impact on how our brain structures are developed. If I don't have the vocabulary to explain how angry I am, if you go back to the picture of the boys, how can I tell you what's going on if I don't have the words? And that becomes a, a interesting problem, okay? Males and females basically start from the same place. Emotions are stored in the amygdala and it goes to the prefrontal cortex. In other words, it goes from the inner part of the brain, the limbic system, to that prefrontal cortex up here. Uh, for boys, it takes a little longer to get there. Now we're talking nanoseconds in real time, okay? For girls, they tend to process emotions throughout the brain. The best example I can give you is this next picture, and you will not forget this image. Here's the parts we just talked about. Here's the amygdala. The frontal lobe would be considered the prefrontal cortex. For males, this is how it tends to work goes from the amygdala to the prefrontal cortex. Now for females, it does the same thing, but look at the significant difference between the two. Starts in the amygdala, goes to the prefrontal cortex, but literally it floods the brain because emotions are linked to everything. And that's not good or bad, right or wrong, it just is what it is. Males may take from one to five hours to process, process emotions effectively. In other words, they're going back into that room, deal with the room inside that brain, kind of identify what's going on there, solve the problem. When it's over, I close the door, I leave. When it's over, it's over. What's so interesting is young boys will really show a lot of emotions from birth to adolescence. Once they start to get to puberty, and puberty unfortunately is uh, coming, it's, it's onset of puberty is increasing and getting there earlier for both boys and girls. But look at what happens. Once boys go through adolescence, once they've uh, hit puberty, they begin to become emotionally unresponsive. In other words, they tend to lock themselves out from dealing with what's going on in their lives. And the problem with that, as we'll see in the next minute or so, is it can lead to serious depression. Without emotional vocabulary, boys run the risk of not being able to verbalize all of his emotions. So that vocabulary is critically important. And male emotional communication, and here's, this is the work of uh, Naomi Way, professor of applied psychology, and she has a lot of uh, information in that, in the video clip that we saw earlier, the mask you live in, so it's some really good information, but here's kind of a summation of what her thinking is. One, males tend to use less positive emotional words, and that's been my experience. Guys talk smack to each other all the time. Uh, second, Boys tend to become more isolated emotionally after the age of 15. And by that, it means I am not gonna necessarily share with my friends what's going on in my life, even though it may be problematic. Tend not to share feelings with friends, prefer to work out problems on their own. And if that is my tendency, here's where that becomes a problem. That can lead to higher levels of depression, and that's not necessarily a good thing. And the tendency is males tend not to get help for that. So we've covered a lot of stuff. I wanna thank you for your devotion and dedication to helping our boys succeed. I'm gonna put up here some other work that we do, and I thank you for your participation and hopefully you'll go back and pick up on some more of the uh, webinars that are available again that first and third Thursday of every month. So these are some of the things that I tend to do, but again, I thank you so much for the opportunity to share this information with you, and I hope you're having a great day today.